and welcome along to the last in our series of studies in the book of Job. This has been a challenging study, not least to get 42 uh, chapters compressed into 12 weeks. But I hope throughout it all you find uh, help in God's word. I'm sure you've noted that there are signs of spring being readily displayed throughout creation. For me, as I uh, go down the driveway at the manse, we see the evidence of the cherry blossom starting to appear on the trees there. And this is evidence of new beginnings. And that's also what we find here in the concluding words of the book of Job. In the midst of his despair, Job had said in chapter 7 and verse 6, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. But as you will realise, that was the perspective from the deepest of valleys. That was from the midst of a desperate situation in which there was such limited scope to see beyond the immediacy of the terrible trials and suffering that Job had to endure. And we know that that was the same experience for the disciples huddled together for fear on that first Easter weekend. With their limited vision, they believed that Jesus' days had come to their end without hope. They couldn't conceive of the infinitely better that lay beyond that darkest of days. But Job was mistaken. The disciples were mistaken. And at times we too can be mistaken and we must be assured as God's children that we will not end our days without hope. Now Job can be forgiven. He had so little to go on, but we are a privileged people. We have the whole of the Bible at our disposal for our information. Through its pages, we can know that God is on our side. We can have confidence that his love for us is not a tepid fondness, but rather is an intensely passionate, self-sacrificing, unbreakable desire. And that's really important. Because Stephen Hawking once said, where there's life, there's hope. But the Bible supersedes that limited perspective to inform us that where there is love, there is hope. Because of the love of God, there is hope through death and beyond the grave. The Apostle Paul writes uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may grieve as others do who have no hope. Yes, God's people do grieve. But their grief is infused with hope. Why? Because of the assurance of the love of God. Again, it's Paul who informs us in the familiar words of 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7 that love always hopes. And so as we come to the end of this series of studies in the book of Job, we do so infused by and inspired by hope, the hope that we have of the love of God for us in Jesus Christ, his son. Let's read the short passage for our study this evening and then we'll get to it. It's found in Job chapter 42, going to read from verse 10 to the end, verses 10 to 17 of the book of Job chapter 42. This is God's word to us. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima and the name of the second Kezia and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. 
and in all the land there was no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived a hundred and forty years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, four generations. And Job died, an old man, full of day. Let's pause in prayer, seeking God's help to understand and apply his word of truth to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have a message even through these ancient words, a message that's relevant not just for today, but for eternity. May you speak into our hearts. May we learn of you. And may we have that assurance of your love to us in Christ so that no matter what happens, However difficult life may become, we know that you will not forsake us. You will not fail us. So bless this time of study together. Feed our souls. Guide our steps. Glorify your name. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before the restoration of Job, that is, before his experience of restored relationships with his family and the return of his substantial wealth, before things are once again right in Job's world, we must see, as Trevor helped us consider last week, that there was repentance which led to restoration in his relationship with God. Before other things can be right, Job himself needs to be right with God. And if our relationship with God is not as it ought to be, it doesn't matter what measure of physical health you might know or what measure of material wealth you may experience, such things will never be able to satisfy you. And if your relationship with God is as it ought to be, then it doesn't matter how poor your health may be or how little wealth you may experience. You will always be satisfied in God. And God's people need to be reminded that there is no material blessing in life that can match the reality of being justified, of being set in a right relationship with God. The Shorter Catechism, question 33, defines justification as follows. Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Think of the prodigal in Luke 15. The prodigal will find no particular delight in wearing a, 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 an ornate robe or a precious ring. He had the experience of such things, these extravagances in the far off country. No, what was of supreme value to him in those moments at the conclusion of that story is the reconciliation with his father, the experience of his father's embrace. And Job's greatest treasure was not his vast herds of camels or oxen, but his Possession of justification before God, his restored relationship with God because of the grace of God. Reading the, the book of Psalms, for example, Psalm 7 verse 8, 17 verse 15, Psalm 18 verse 20 and 24, Psalm 26 verses 1 and 11. There we find repeated pleas that God would treat the psalmist according to his righteousness. And for years I've been reading uh, those Psalms, those verses, and telling myself that I wouldn't dare to do that. I would never come before God and plead my righteousness. Sadly, I fail to, to recognize that the righteousness I must plead in God's presence is not my own, but Christ's perfect righteousness. And that is my possession gifted to me, not by merit, but by grace. Before we move ahead, we reflect on the blessings, or before we reflect on the blessings of, of, of Job's latter days, we have to ensure that we have this foundation, this necessary precursor in place. Before all that is to follow is reflected upon, we must see that Job 
is restored, is reconciled in his relationship with God. That was the most precious thing that he needed. That was the most precious thing that he ever possessed. The second thing we need to note then is Job's restored relationships with his friends. Verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. The King James Version renders this verse. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now there appears at first sight to be quite a difference between what the ESV says and what the King James Version says. But both are attempting to uh, translate a word which is in Hebrew, Shavut, that speaks of exile, that speaks of being uprooted, dragged away from all that is held dear, all that is of value. And that's where Job was until he prayed for his friends. And why is that? Well, you see, there were two problems that Job needed to address. Firstly, Job had sinned against God. Now, his three friends were wrong to accuse Job of having committed some serious sin that deserved the suffering that befell him. They did this in the midst of his trial but, but Job then and there in that time of extremists did sin against God. He demanded that God, his creator, owed him an explanation for all the torments that had come crashing down upon him. This was Job's sin and Job had sinned. And secondly, we must understand that Job's friends had sinned against Job through their false accusations and their erroneous assertions that he was refusing to confess some serious sin. Job required forgiveness. Job's friends required forgiveness. And for Job to experience forgiveness, he needed first to forgive his friends. Job's experience of forgiveness was dependent upon his willingness to forgive those who had wronged him. You know well how Jesus taught the disciples to pray what we call the Lord's Prayer. And there in that template prayer, we are to say, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Matthew 6 verse 12. The only hope, says Jesus, to to know forgiveness is when you yourself are ready to forgive. You forgive to be forgiven. Job forgives his friends, prays for them to know forgiveness for himself. My two daughters have a game they like to play. They, they like to leave a certain children's book, a really uh, terrible version of Jack and the Beanstalk, in each other's homes when they visit. So they, you visit the house and you slide it somewhere under a cushion on the sofa and it remains undiscovered for a long time and then it appears and then it's returned to send or brought back to the, the person who had left it there at the earliest opportunity. Perhaps you know something about that. Maybe you've given someone a gift and later on they have returned it to you. They have given it back to you and you weren't maybe particularly chuffed by that. But there is, however, one wonderful gift that keeps boomerang back to you the more you try to give it away. And that is the prayer for blessing, whether it's upon your friends or whether it's upon your enemies. As you pray God's blessing on them, your life is blessed. The more you give away blessing, the more you gain. Job prayed for his friends and he was blessed. I hope you have good friends. Good friends are very precious, but even our best friends can fail us. Do we pray for them? And if we feel wronged by them, is it our instinct quickly, eagerly to offer forgiveness to them? Job is reconciled in his relationship with God. He's restored in his relationship with his friends. And thirdly, we see the return of Job's substantial wealth. It's a bit like a fairy tale ending, that they all lived happily ever after. Once again, Job is a wealthy man with vast amounts of livestock and a beautiful family. And once again, I remind you, 
that throughout his terrible ordeal, Job has prayed not for wealth, or for health, or for family, but that God would come to his defence. And that's what we know to happen in these verses. We must never assume that there is a direct relationship between a person's piety and their prosperity. But here we see that at the end of his life, Job receives rich rewards. But again, these are not what he sought in the midst of his trial. He sought God to speak to him, God to reveal himself, God to make his ways known to Job. This was what he longed for in the worst of his suffering. And here, in these words, we find echoes of messianic prophecies. The hope that the coming Messiah would bring blessing to his people. For example, in Isaiah 61 and verse 7, we read these words. Instead of your shame there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonour, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore their land they shall possess, in their land they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. And that's what Job receives. He receives a double portion of the wealth that he lost. And we must see eternal rewards in this. Echoes of heaven in these verses. Look at the the sweet meal fellowship that his friends enjoy. Think of the riches that are given, the inheritance that is promised, the beauty and the, the long life, the reward of the faithful, those who endure to the end. When Jesus was speaking of the rewards for faithfulness, he said in Mark chapter 10 and verses 29 and 30, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, (coughs) excuse me, with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, clearly, Jesus did not mean this literally, that these words would be taken literally. (coughs) It would take, it would make uh, Mother's Day particularly challenging if you had a hundred of them to visit on that day. No, we're not going to get a hundred mothers, but at the end of all things, if we remain faithful unto them, we will be blessed. God's child, while thankful for every gift gained in life, does not anticipate the receiving of God's greatest blessings in this time and in this place. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. No, the hope of the Christian. This sure and certain foundation for life is a hope that extends beyond death. Archbishop Desmond Tutu put it like this. Hope is being able to see that there is a light despite all of the darkness. And it will only be when we put on the imperishable of the new heavenly body, see 1 Corinthians 15 and 50, that we will be able to come into the nearer presence of God and experience the glorious fellowship for which we were created and find there the true riches that Jesus has won for us. Our hope is a heavenly hope. So what is the book of Job? all about? Well, first and foremost, we must understand that the, the book is not about suffering or perseverance. About, it's not about sin or its consequences. Rather, it's a book about God, a book about a big God, a God who is so big that we cannot, we must not try to squeeze him into neatly packaged answers to the questions of the mysteries of life. Even there's a warning here in these chapters of those who dare to speak out for God, like his Job's discomforting comforters, that we at times with our simplistic notions about him may be 
angering God, not honouring him. True wisdom. True wisdom is attained when God's child reaches the place of humility, admitting that he or she doesn't understand, but still he or she trusts in him. It's like the mantra of my mother that keeps haunting me these days. She always says, trust in the Lord and don't despair. He is a friend so true. No matter what your troubles are, Jesus will see you through. And we must arrive at that place where we can sing with the children of Israel as they were taught by Moses to sing in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 3 and 4, which says, Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. This is a book all about God. But secondly, this is a book about Job, a man who was blessed at the beginning and at the conclusion of his life. But between those two bookends, suffered incredibly. And suffering was not in proportion to his sin. But as we learn from our glimpses of the courts of heaven, rather it was on account of his righteousness, his good living brought him into these trials. But it is suffering that is designed by God to lift our eyes beyond the here and now, to look to the infinitely better by far, which is as yet beyond. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, saying, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Again, he says, Romans 8 and 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Peter adds, 1 Peter 4, 13, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Job suffers to lift his eyes, to look beyond. And thirdly, in this week leading up to Easter Sunday, we are reminded that the book of Job also speaks clearly to us of the cross of Calvary. In Job's suffering, we see a picture of the greater Job, the sinless son of God who endures the greatest shame and torment. He's abandoned by his friends. He's taken outside the city into its rubbish dump and there he suffers. There he dies in God forsaken darkness for the transgressions of others. Job's foolish friends were right in this regard. God must punish sin. God must send suffering to atone for the wrongs committed by this world. But he doesn't do this to the people of the world. He does this in incredible mercy to his son. And when you wonder, does God really care about my suffering, about my struggles? You need only lift your eyes and look to the cross to find the answer. There, God transforms unimaginable suffering into immeasurable blessing. There he whispers to you, trust me. In 1680, Alan Cameron, the father of martyr for the cause of Presbyterianism, Richard Cameron, was imprisoned in Edinburgh. And there, while incarcerated, Alan Cameron was, was shown that the head and the hands that had been cut off his dead son. And they cruelly asked him, could he identify them? And old Cameron answered, I know them. I know them. They are my sons, my own dear sons. It is the Lord. Good is the will of the Lord who cannot wrong me nor mine, but has made goodness and mercy to follow us all our days. It is only those whose hope is secure in Christ, 
who can speak like this. So it is that Johnny Erickson Tata puts it in her devotional book, Secret Strength for Those Who Search, she writes. God's pruning shears seem merciless. Nothing escapes the cutting edge of his will. Not the blossom of youth, nor the bloom of good health nor the fruit of prosperity, nor the sturdy growing family. None of these fall outside the pruning effects of God's purposes. But spring comes, doesn't it? Much to our amazement, it even came to Job. A spring of such fragrance and beauty that his long, bitter winter must have seemed like a bad dream. Hope returned. New life pokes up from the dead stump. Joy reappears ever so slowly, almost shyly, and not all at once. But it comes. Fresh new grace enables us to endure. Bright hopeful promises offer a strong trellis to which we can cling. The sweet fragrance of the Holy Spirit blows across our lives waters us with his word and encourages us to reach for all the good things God has in store for us. In God's order, winter always gives way to spring. The iron grip of January yields to the sunshine of his love. If not now, then soon. Spring will not tarry. New life is on the way. That's the message of Easter. That's the message of Job. That's the hope that fills the heart of those who believe that Jesus died and rose again and will bring all those who believe in him to be with him forever, where joy never ends. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful to you that you bless our lives, you care for us, you meet our needs. Thank you that while you watch over us and supply us so generously, so richly in life, the greater by far is yet to be beyond death. When we see you face to face, when we live forever in your presence, where once God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and then there'll be no more need for tears because all sickness, sadness, all sorrow will be gone. Death will be no more. We thank you that this hope is ours because of the cross, because of the empty tomb, because of the message of the angel that he is not here, he is risen. The first fruits of all those who believe in him. So may the hope of heaven infuse our hearts. May it strengthen us for the trials of this day. And may we know abundantly the grace, mercy and peace that comes from Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Now and until we see him face to face. Amen.